Well, I want to go on with the uh, story that we started last week. Uh, and this gets into uh, the current situation uh, this week. Last week we talked about how in the 19th century we had this major change in thinking. Scientists came up to the 19th century almost all believing in the recent creation, the Bible, uh, and so on. And then we had this major shift. It was gradual. Uh, most of it occurred in the last quarter of the 19th century. Uh, uh, and, uh, but God was rejected from scientific interpretations. Uh, the philosophers and uh, clergymen and so on, who were the leaders of society, uh, were rejected from science. Science came to its own as a powerful independent entity at that time, and it adopted a naturalistic philosophy where they just wanted to limit their conclusions to what they saw and so on. Uh, and religion was rejected from the interpretational uh, menu of science, per se. And that's, we are more or less in that situation right now, but it's more complicated than that. Uh, a couple of books, <coughs> several of you are interested in the books I brought last time, so I brought another couple of books here. Uh, Modern Cosmology and Philosophy, is edited by, by John Lentz, Leslie of Gulf uh, University in Canada. Uh, excellent book, if you're interested in the uh, question of the fine-tuned universe. Uh, he gives you the whole picture here. It, it's not his book, it's just a symposium volume, it be about a couple of dozen authors, but they're the guys that did the change. Uh, of thinking into this question of the fine-tuned universe, uh, which we referred to several times. Th this other one here, <coughs> a classic, uh, Science is Not Enough, Van Var Bush. It's actually the first chapter uh, is entitled Science is Not Enough, and there's other chapters that he's written. Van Var Bush is considered by some to be the father or the grandfather of the modern computer, MIT executive, and so on and so forth, uh, but he makes that very important point that science is not enough. We'll get into that today a little bit. So let, let's uh, look briefly, and I might state uh, we've got lots to cover today, so uh, <coughs> we'll try and uh, <coughs> move right along. Uh, and uh, hope question, most questions at the end, although if we're stuck on something, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, 20th century. Uh, well, uh, people weren't all that satisfied at the beginning of the 20th century with uh, evolution, although it, it had been accepted quite well. Uh, there was a, a notable group at Princeton University uh, which started something which is very important. Uh, and that was the idea that, hey, let's put long ages and evolution or God and so on together. Uh, with the Bible, except we will reinterpret the Bible for long ages. And many, many Christian groups follow this particular pattern at present. They, well, yeah, sure, I, I believe, but Genesis, uh, that's an allegory and so on. It was lots of, lots of time. And so we, we had this, uh, this group at Princeton initiated, I suppose, although I'm sure the idea was there before, that, uh, hey, you can put the Bible and science together, just reinterpret the Bible. Uh, and then early in the 20th century, we had George McCready Price, uh, probably the, the uh, outstanding leader in this uh, battle at that time, a Seventh-day Adventist, wrote a couple dozen books and uh, advocated uh, creation the little interpretation of uh, the Bible and so on. Uh, historians right now, uh, especially around numbers, and his group are uh, 
saying that <coughs> this is where the creation movement started. And uh, they go from uh, Ellen White to George McCready Price to uh, Henry Morris, and then the thing spread all over the world. Uh, I'm not sure those links are solid, completely solid, but uh, there's, there's uh, some basis for, for what they say. Well, uh, going on from there, uh, very interesting uh, little sidelight on the pictures. As uh, science was becoming more and more uh, self-sufficient and uh, uh, considered adequate and so on, uh, this Vienna Circle developed. It was a group of very bright scientists and uh, mathematicians in Vienna <coughs> in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, they emphasized science, mathematics, logic, and so on. Leader was uh, Moritz Schlick. Uh, other brilliant minds, uh, they're mostly Jews. Uh, one of their members, uh, got studying this mathematics carefully and uh, set theory and uh, came up with uh, Gödel's proof. Okay, Gödel, and th this has been a major uh, event in the, uh, I might say, uh, questioning of, hey, how good is just a simple mechanistic, uh, materialistic uh, approach type of thing? Uh, because uh, in that theorem, which is called uh, the incompleteness theorem, he showed that you know, if you have any set of items that are large enough to be interesting, there's no way to prove that they're complete. And if you can't prove they're complete, then you can't prove that you've got a solid case. And in other words, the idea of getting, hey, I'm, going to have, I'm just going to stay by that, which is absolutely firm here, this throws it out. You can't do that. Reality is not that simple. Well, uh, <coughs> interesting event. Uh, the group was led by uh, Moritz Schlitz, and uh, one day Moritz Schlitz was going up the stairs uh, in the, uh, at the University of Vienna there, and his student, uh, Jonathan Nelbach, uh, confronted him and shot him four shots, killed him. Well, uh, Hitler was taking over Austria at this time, and there were all kinds of uh, confusion and different ideas of what, what happened and so on. But uh, to me, the interesting point here in all this is that when uh, John Johann, I guess you'd call it, Nelbach, uh, defended having killed Schlick. He said that Schlick's philosophy had interfered with his moral restraint. In other words, when you try and boil reality down to a purely mechanistic level, uh, you have no morals left. And that's, you know, that was his excuse for it. Uh, at this time, you know, I, the thing got political. Uh, Jews uh, were not welcome, and uh, uh, actually, uh, Schlick was not a Jew, but they kind of grouped him with it and so on. And all kinds of stories were invented about why this happened. Uh, supposed to be a, a triangle between Nelbach and uh, Schlick and so on. Uh, others say that Schlick had uh, failed Nelbach and so on. Uh, that was the reason and so on. All kinds of excuses were, were, were put out there, as you expect. Uh, <coughs> but the very fact that uh, he used this defense, and he got two years in prison for this, incidentally, uh, <coughs> tells you a little bit about uh, the, the fact that that can be raised a moral restraint, raises, raises the important point. He, what about morality when you adopt uh, a simple mechanistic view uh, of the universe? <coughs> well, uh, 
j just very briefly, Pill Down Man, you've probably heard of Pill Down Man. He shows up at this time as a good, solid, intermediate uh, in the uh, evolution of man. Uh, they were looking for missing links there, of course, and <coughs> he uh, it was a medieval skull uh, that was the, uh, attached to the jaw of an orangutan, which was much younger. And uh, for 40 years, uh, it's held a position. In fact, in the, the famous Scopes trial, uh, uh, Daryl used uh, this as an example of proof of evolution, uh, per se. Scientists say, oh yeah, we always doubted that thing and so on, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and there, there were all those questions about it and so on. But, uh, but it uh, tells you a little bit about the, the atmosphere at, at that particular time. Then we go on here to the Scopes trial, uh, which uh, world famous. Uh, just a little town in Dayton, Tennessee, and uh, they're not supposed to teach evolution in, in the school of Tennessee. This teacher is supposed to have done it. Some question about whether they did it or not, but anyway, they, they made a trial out of it. And uh, the uh, Scopes was found guilty of doing this and later acquitted on the basis of a technicality. Uh, worldwide, uh, interest in this. Uh, George McCready Price, having to be in England, was invited to this. He did not come from England, you can understand. Travel wasn't that easy in those days. Uh, but it attracted worldwide attention, and the question wasn't, you know, as his teacher taught evolution, which was the law, of course. The question was, was evolution or creation uh, correct? There's a picture of the uh, courthouse there, and uh, Dayton, Tennessee, at the Scopes trial, uh, and the person to the left here standing up there, that is Clarence Darrow, who is defending evolution, and Williams Jennings Bryan, uh, three times candidate for the presidency, uh, what was defending creation and so on, and all kinds of stories have uh, arisen from that, but the, uh, the general tendency has been uh, to uh, say, well, uh, Darrow quashed Brian. There was, and so on. Well, a couple of historians, uh, including uh, uh, no Ron Numbers and uh, Ed Larson, Ron Numbers at the University of Wisconsin, Ed Larson over here in uh, Pepperdine now, <coughs> uh, say, hey, that's not the case. They've gone back and look at the newspaper. They say, well, probably, probably William Jennings Bryan won in the public press. But since then, the story is, you know, uh, no, uh, uh, Darrow won, evolution won. And, and it's held, you know, as a great victory for, for evolution, this trial, per se. Well, uh, this is, this is, uh, very much questionable. It's likely wrong. Keep that in mind. Uh, stories uh, get leagues of their own, and uh, we, we discussed that last week <coughs> uh, in connection with Wilberforce. Uh, May Huxley. I ask a question? Yes. Uh, for those of us who have come from other places where we have witnessed history being revised even in front <coughs> of our eyes, um, why is that resorted to? Is it not sufficient to say, <laughs> if we don't like something that happened in the past, can't we just say we don't like what happened, we want it differently? Why mm -hmm. attempt to revise the past? Uh, this also mm -hmm. goes hand in hand with our human tendency uh, for various conflicts <coughs> in which we want to quite literally erase the fact that <coughs> our uh, opponents ever existed, in fact. Hence, mm -hmm. the burnings of libraries and any uh, dis uh, wanton <coughs> destruction of anything that looks like civilization 
that preceded ours and things of that ilk, uh, which, is, which <laughs> ends up ultimately our loss. We as a human race have repeatedly been doing this kind of thing, where we have uh, de determinedly, deliberately been destroying the memory of the past as if the memory is somehow a threat to us. That, to me, is the best evidence that there is something shaky about the present. If we are threatened mm -hmm. by the memory of some historical mm -hmm. event. Yeah, yeah hi history belongs to the victors. Uh, they make the history however they want to. This has been done over the millennia. We, uh, wh whoever uh, has the microphone wins or whoever has the, the ear uh, of the public and so on uh, tends to win. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that, uh, uh, about the agenda here. May, may I just add to what you just said? History belongs to the victors, so the victors imagine. Exactly. That mm. is not the truth. Mm. History is what history is, whether the victor likes it or not. Right, right. The, the facts are what they are, whether mm -hmm. we accept them or not. And mm -hmm. ultimately, we will all come into a collision with the truth, with the obvious, that cannot be negated. Right. And we'll all be standing mm -hmm. side by side before the final arbiter where all such machinations will fall to the ground as useless. Yeah, we'll be discussing, uh, is there an agenda here? Uh, one section here later on here, where uh, you, uh, that question will, will uh, uh, come up here. But we must mention something. The uh, uniformitarianism that we had uh, came into vogue uh, in the 1830s, uh, Charles Lyell's work and so on, uh, kind of broke down in the 1960s uh, when, they, hey, all geological changes can't be slow. Turbidites, I believe rapid flow, uh, came into vogue at that time. Uh, Alvarez, uh, his idea that uh, boloids had killed the dinosaurs came into vogue at that time and so on. and. Uh, Uniformitarianism lost out there. The new uniformitarianism called neo I mean neocatastrophism is not the same as the flood at all. It puts a lot of time in there, but it recognizes a lot of catastrophes. And you have this uh, statement from the journal Science. You know, it's a great philosophical breakthrough for geologists to accept catastrophe as a normal part of Earth history. So, so we we. Uh, they're moving in the right direction uh, in terms of that, the, the uh, idea of a strict uniformitarianism has broken down. And you can talk about catastrophes now in geology. Anyway, uh, <coughs> interesting affair here. This is a term, uh, uh, sometimes it's called the, the uh, National Society of Biology Teachers Affair. It tells you a little bit about the thinking. 1995, they wrote a statement, you know, always getting into this, this, this battle is, is salient in, in the various groups here. Uh, 95, is declaring evolution to be, quote, an unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable, and natural process. Well, when that statement got out, it caused what it's called the affair. Uh, and people were saying, hey, you, you're, uh, you're advocating atheism here. And that, that's not very popular. And um, so they, they uh, uh, were accused, hey, uh, and so some accused them of being going into theology, which they were. They were making a statement, hey, there is no God. And that, that's a theological statement to, to some people anyway. Uh, I, I think it's... Uh, a broader statement than that. But anyway, uh, 
And so they, after extended disputations, they decided to remove those two words, unsupervised and impersonal. It tells you a little bit about the, the battle that's going on here in, in this region. Well, and then Anthony flew, uh, this is uh, into uh, this decade actually, 204, just to mention that. Uh, a rather interesting thing, this atheist, uh, written a couple dozen books and so on, and he uh, said, hey, you know, he, he'd been advocating, he was the icon of the uh, intellectual community, more or less, for, for atheism, and here he said, hey, no, there's got to be a God. And on what basis did he make that decision? Uh, the fine-tuned universe, uh, DNA, how did DNA get started? And he, he, and he especially accuses Charles Darwin and Richard Dawkins of forgetting about reproduction, biological reproduction. Now, you know, biological reproduction is a very complex thing. Mitosis, meiosis, and all this stuff involved in biological reproduction very complex thing. He says, hey, Darwin and Dawkins, they don't touch that. There's got to be, there's got to be that. So, uh, the battle goes on here. Uh, we got to move on into uh, <coughs> uh, a little more uh, <coughs> related to this, and that is this, this question of uh, confidence in evolution. The leaders of the scientific community are rather very firm on this issue. And uh, Ernst Meyer, uh, famous uh, Harvard evolutionary icon, uh, a very bright person, I mean, right? he's, he's written very well and so on about evolution and so on. Uh, he writes, uh, after 1859, that's when Darwin published his Origin of Species, in 1859, there was never again any doubt about the correctness of the evolutionary explanation of organic diversity. There's no question about it. Uh, that's part of the media we're in right now. Uh, <coughs> another one, uh, Douglas Futama from the University of Michigan and uh, uh, New York State University, Stonebrook. Anyway. <coughs> He writes in, in this uh, most popular book about uh, evolu evolution. He, it's a great big, oh my, I don't know, 500 page book, 400 page book. At least. Evolutionary biologists today do not concern themselves with trying to demonstrate the reality of evolution. This is simply no longer an issue and hasn't been for more than a century. The, the idea among these leaders is that, hey, we don't even bother to ask the question anymore. And uh, you can go on with uh, this one. This is interesting. It just came out a couple of months ago, well, three or four months, February 2013. <coughs> Revised Statement on Teaching Evolution, Geological Society of America. This is what they have to say about it. <coughs> uh, I won't bother to go through all of it. You can read it if you want to, but uh, notice the first blue statement. Says, if a question cannot be framed so that the answer can be tested and the test results can be reproduced by others, then it is not science. And they're getting around that using this argument, which is being used so much lately, that, hey, uh, uh, don't bother us with creation and so on. That's not science. And they, they define God out of science to make that statement. I hope you understand it. it this is part of that change we've been talking about and thinking. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, if you can't test it, it's not science, we're not going to look at it. Why limit your uh, cod of investigation to, to just what you can test? Uh, what if you, aren't there any things beyond what you can test? Uh, a very limiting uh, type of thing. And you can have a field day with the resonant part of that statement. Uh, can be reproduced by others. And the test can be, so on. Boy, we could take out a whole bunch of science of that little statement. Uh, such as multiverses, you know, or, or paleontologists who say, hey, uh, uh, 
this organism must have lived uh, 200,000, I'm saying 200 million, or, or even some a billion years earlier. We don't have the fossils, but we know that fossil evolution is slow and so on. Uh, try and test that one. Uh, or uh, the suggestion that uh, some insect and some worm got together, mated, and produced the uh, caterpillar butterfly thing. Uh, try and test that one. Uh, I mean, you're going to have to wipe out quite a bit of science. You're going to follow this thing. Uh, and then they go down here and say, creationism is not science because it invokes supernatural phenomena that cannot be tested. That sounds pretty good at first, but uh, why do, can't you say, like I've written down here below accordingly, evolution is not science because it invokes speculations that cannot be tested. And uh, we can give you a whole bunch of uh, speculations about the origin of life, for instance. Uh, so much in that area cannot be tested. So you're going to eliminate uh, things that cannot be tested. You're going to have to take out a lot of evolution. So uh, uh, this, is, this is the battle we find ourselves in here. Uh, a few points of discussion here. Uh, regarding this, uh, one ideas change over the millennia. Uh, this, uh, how do we know we're, we're in, in the right era when ideas change so much? In antiquity, the mind, uh, like Plato, that was so important. Reason was so important. Uh, that was the big thing. Uh, then things changed in the Middle Ages and during periods of scholasticism, where you got rhetoric. Uh, logic, uh, authority, Aristotle's authority especially, and so on, uh, was the accepted norm. Uh, then that was abandoned as we went through uh, last week uh, for, for a uh, materialistic uh, philosophy. Uh, and the point I'm making here is, how do we know this is going to hold up? Man keeps changing his basic broad uh, philosophies and uh, these are, uh, you know, uh, matrices that, that affect your whole thinking, your vocabulary, everything else. Uh, these are very serious things that we don't often uh, ask questions about, but that question needs to be raised. Uh, and keep in mind, there's a lot of good materialistic data that is making it very hard to believe in evolution. I just thought I'd summarize it. You folks here are familiar with all these. We don't need hardly take any time for it. But the fine-tuned universe, what's, what's the chance that it could happen? Uh, 10 raised to 10 raised to the 123rd power. Anyway, it's not very likely to happen. Uh, so many of them fine things put together here by uh, at Oxford University. His name slips my mind right now. Anyway, uh, Morowitz talked about the origin of life. Ten to the minus five billion power. I mean, this is very improbable, folks. When you get those kind of figures, you need to start thinking about alternatives. It, uh, Origin events, complexity, uh, this is uh, irreducible complexity, ID, and so on. Uh, very serious problem. Uh, it's not just origin of life, it's origin of something like the eye, uh, and so on. Rates of genetic change, we've discussed this here, you know, uh, uh, and uh, Gouger's work, and uh, John uh, Sanford's work and uh, Mont uh, his work, you know, this is good solid data that is saying, hey, there's something, is it, our, our closed system here, materialism, is not working. Uh, gaps between fossils of major groups of organisms, the Cambrian explosion, I mean, this is a tremendous case for. Uh, something uh, creation or something special 
uh, hunted all those and animal file arrives at about the same time. Uh, do you like time challenges? Uh, erosion rates way too fast uh, for geologic time. Residual carbon-14 suggests way things are much younger. Uh, paraconformities all over the place. Uh, it doesn't look like that those millions of years occurred. This is solid, hard uh, data. And quite a widespread geologic formations. Uh, uh, just go out there and look at those things. You can't put it into the present model of the Earth, of uh, slow changes, rivers, deposit lakes forming here, and all this stuff. So they try some a little bit to do that, but man, those widespread things. The past had to be very different. Uh, again, very hard data. So. Uh, several of these are in the category uh, miracles tested rationally and found to be true. Uh, the rational position is, hey, this data tells me uh, that uh, the biblical story uh, has some good solid validity. Well, uh, notice the, the issue comments about the issue. <coughs> The deeper question is not, what is science? Which is, you know, uh, you, you saw some of that in that statement from the uh, Geological Society of America, and certainly I happen to be a member of the Geological Society of America. I'm not sure if I should be proud of it or not. Uh, the real question is, what is true? What is ultimate truth? What is reality? Current discussions tend to bypass that question, concentrate on the definition of science. It's so repeatedly. One of the issues come up in court uh, or in discussions and uh, school boards and uh, <coughs> all this about whether we're going to teach creation. And he said, but it's not science. We can't teach it in a science class. So God is excluded. God is excluded right out of the picture there uh, in this. Well, one can define science any one choose. But you can't get rid of creation or God just by defining them out of the way. They're still there. And uh, you can say it's not science. They're still part of the intellectual matrix uh, that we can reason with. <clears throat> uh, where science gets in trouble is that by limiting its scope to materialism, it eliminates its right to consider questions beyond that limited scope. Uh, although it tries to do that. And science has attempted to explain altruism for an ideal example of that, you know, why, why are some animals take care of each other and so on. Uh, it's not survival of the fittest, as you'd expect. And then when science excludes God from explaining your manager, it's effectively saying that there is no God and that, that is, gets into a theological statement. And so uh, you're not stained by science. Uh, when you act as though there is no God, you're effectively making, uh, to a certain extent, a theological statement. I'm not uh, saying that God is a theological. I think there's a lot of science that witnesses to God, uh, as we showed in the, in the previous slide. So let, let's go on here a little bit more. Uh, keep in mind, that in terms of uh, looking for truth and uh, your, your horizon uh, of investigation, the Bible is broader, more open. Uh, for instance, uh, Psalms 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, firm and showeth his handiwork. The, the Bible points to science, and uh, even the scientific method is is suggested here in the Thessalonians 5 to 1. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Uh, this is, you know, this is a good scientific method. Hey, test it out. Keep what's good. Uh, so uh, we've, got, we've got an interesting picture here where the, the Bible is open to nature, the study of nature and so on as well as uh, <coughs> study of God, and, uh, meaning and uh, morality, all those other factors in the Bible. 
and so on. But the scientific community at present, at least its leadership, uh, it, it limits science to, to materialism, and that's a restricted view. Uh, the scientific approach right now is a much more restricted view than the biblical view. Uh, is science exclusive? There are suggestions that, uh, uh, yeah, there, there, there uh, probably some prejudice here. We get a little bit into that a little further, uh, but uh, some examples here. <coughs> Stephen Gould wrote this book, you know, Rocks of Ages. There's a title of the book, and he's written articles on this and so on. Where <coughs> he says that science and religion are non-overlapping magisteria. They won't even overlap. Keep the two separate, uh, is what he's saying. Uh, may I have a question here? Sorry. Um, if that's the case, then why do the evolutionists keep making incursions into the religious topics? Why do they mm -hmm. want to answer or why do they pretend they have answers to the questions of origins of life when they themselves admit that they really don't know? They just know that mm -hmm. the uh, theological answers to those questions are wrong and they want to invalidate mm -hmm. those. In other words, yeah. they say are non-overlapping magisteria except we want to take over the territory that has belonged to religion, and religion gets squeezed out, essentially, of more and more. Mm -hmm. Good point. Very good point. Uh, look at this one here. Uh, Kansas State University by Scott Todd. Even if all data point to an internal designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Again, taking a very restricted view uh, of science for uh, don't bother us with this other stuff. Uh, Harvard physicist Philip Frank, <coughs> every influence of moral religious political consideration upon the acceptance of a theory as regards the religion by the community of scientists. Don't touch those other areas. Um, this kind of implies, you know, that Science may be better than other methods in a quarry. Uh, it is the best method of thought. Uh, I would say it is a very good method of thought. Uh, but is it the only one? No. Uh, then the question of academic freedom comes up here, and that is uh, Science stance is a restricted view, as we've uh, emphasized uh, in the last few slides and so on. But what about academic freedom? Are you going to allow free investigation? Science has lost its credentials in terms of basic questions and say, hey, I won't look at that. Don't talk to me about God. No, I, I, I just deal with science. Uh, this is not academic freedom. Uh, this is not the way to find truth. What if God exists? Uh, if you want to find truth, and science likes to talk as though it's finding truth, it ought to be open uh, to ideas that uh, may be a little beyond the simple materialistic uh, interpretations. That would be uh, more open. If science is... Uh, both the study and interpretations about nature, it ought to be open to, to more possibilities uh, than it is kind of excluding right at present. Uh, and this illustrates a little bit of the problem. Uh, experiential factors. Uh, we, we experience a lot of materialism, you know, things we see and so on that are immediately in front of us. We, we like that, and this is what <coughs> science bases itself on at present. But what about the rest of reality beyond that? Like consciousness, this is one that's mentioned so often by, by um, thinkers and philosophers and uh, 
Not quite a number of scientists, actually. Why do we have that feeling that we exist? You're not going to find that in matter. Go study in matter all you want. You're not going to find anything that can give you consciousness. But this seems to be something unique, special. Uh, free will, that really runs into trouble with the scientific method. It tends to counter the idea of cause and effect. If it's free, uh, willpower and so on, though, the issue involved in there and so on, if that, that is free, you know, uh, our whole penal system is based on uh, free will. A person is responsible for uh, his acts, uh, his actions and so on, and he's punished for that. Morality, that question comes up quite often. <coughs> we get to it a little bit later. Uh, but you don't find that in matter. Moral principles. <coughs> Reason, why can we think things out, uh, do mathematics, and so on. Uh, again, there's nothing in matter when you look at it that tells you, hey, uh, I should be able to reason. Uh, love and hate, characteristics that we are, we are aware of. Uh, again, uh, not found in, in matter. Creativity, uh, art. Music, why do we enjoy music? Uh, these are things that tell you hey, there's a reality beyond uh, the materialism. And if you're looking for truth, why not have the, the big rectangle here as your horizon of investigation than just the materialism? Material is just a part of reality. Well, uh, <coughs> experiential factors uh, and so on. Why limit to materialism? That's too simplistic. Religion is not as objective as materialism, but it is much more meaningful. And I, I think that it's true. Keep that in mind. Uh, materialism does work. Uh, I have much more confidence in uh, when I read in the book that the uh, specific gravity of quartz is 2.65. Of course, there's some quartz that's uh, clear up to 4. But anyway, for normal quartz, it's 2.65. I love that stuff. It's firm. You don't have to argue with it. You start singing, me, singing to me a song like uh, Roll Over Beethoven. I don't even remember that song or not. But anyway, uh, I'm not as confident that that is true, I might tell you. So keep in mind. Uh, materialism is good, it's very good, but it's not everything type thing. Evolution of this competition, survival of the fittest, results in the reign of tooth and claw. We, we should not have uh, goodness. Uh, uh, everything is not just fighting everybody else trying to survive, survival of the fittest type of thing. Uh, there's the, the, that doesn't fit the reality that we, we see about us. Uh, Houston Smith put that very well, a f famous philosopher. Uh, said, envisioning the way things are. There's no better place to begin with modern science. Equally, there's no worse place to end. Don't stop there. Well, is there an agenda? A delicate question. Uh, because it tends to challenge the integrity of science, per se. Uh, but uh, let's, let's look at a, a few factors here in, in this picture. And uh, Danilo was referring to some of them a little earlier here and so on. But we, we've talked about, for instance, the flat earth fallacy. Remember we talked about that last uh, week? Uh, Pilled down man, we just mentioned it uh, today. Heckles embryos, we mentioned those last week. Uh, these are proposals that are false, they tended to support evolution, they turned out to be wrong. Why go and invent things like build down man and so on? Uh, it's, it looks like maybe there's an agenda here. Uh, I, I was struck when I was in graduate school, so many bio journal articles they include a discussion or comments about evolutionary implications of the data uh, when even the data is only remotely related to it. It's kind of a 
you know, you, you have to put that little paragraph in there uh, towards the end to, to mention evolution and express your faith in, in the, the doctrine and so on. Uh, when, I, when I was taking my graduate biology, uh, one of the things that made me uh, concerned uh, about evolution being true, and I, I was not trying to show that it would be true at all, but one of the things that uh, uh, helped me think that it maybe it wasn't true was the fact uh, almost every class they had to present this evolutionary uh, dogma or defense of evolution per se, even when it wasn't related to the data, it all made me think, there's got to be an agenda here. Well, moving on from this, uh, <coughs> an example of uh, this, uh, the question that is asked, you know, these ideas move on. and. Uh, when in a class you, you ask the question, uh, how did life evolve? Uh, you're implying that life did evolve. You see, the questions you ask so often influence uh, the, the, the ethos of the class and the, uh, the idea, the dominant ideas and so on. Uh, you should be asking, you know, did life evolve? As presently practiced, science is the odd combination of the study of nature and a secular philosophy that excludes God out. So we, we got science, study of nature, that's great, fine, fine. Then you got this philosophy, hey, don't put God in the picture. You can exclude God by definition, but that does not work well in case God exists. Well, we mentioned that earlier. Uh, secularism and science, just a few examples here that uh, tell you uh, there seems to be something uh, uh, suspiciously uh, suggesting an agenda. Uh, Stephen Gould he talk, he talks about uh, an intelligent designer as being a fallacy that is historically moth-eaten. Uh, well, uh, it, it's not historically moth-eaten. An awful lot of scientists believe in God. <coughs> Uh, the Julian Huxley, uh, he's, this is the grandson of uh, Thomas Huxley, he talks about organisms are built as if purposely designed, the purpose is only apparent, an apparent one. Uh, are you looking fairly at the data when you make a statement like that? The blind watchmaker, Richard Dawkins, Biology is a study of complicated things that give appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And he spends the rest of the book uh, uh, showing that that's not the case, uh, according to him, of course. And uh, Francis Crick, uh, Nobel laureate. Uh, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. Uh, it's really hard to not conclude that they're, you know, they're, they're trying to pr show something here. It looks like there, there is an agenda here that they uh, are not open to the idea of a creator. And uh, you know, this study we've talked about several times before here about scientists still communicating, done by Ed Larson. Uh, I think he's, he's over at Pepperdine University right now. Um, a thousand scientists were asked, from, from American men and women of science, and asked if they believe in God and the definition of God that they were told. There are all kinds of definitions of God. I believe in a God, an intellectual and effective communication of humankind. In other words, a God to whom one may pray in expectation of receiving an answer. This is the kind of God that uh, is used in this survey. By answer, I mean more than subjective psychological effect of prayer. In other words, hey, do you believe in a God that answers prayer? If you do, you can say yes. Well, the results were 40% of them believe in that kind of God. Shocking figure, I mean, 40% of scientists. 45% uh, do not believe in it, 15% do not know. Uh, was the result of that survey. So, uh, 
the picture is more complicated than, than uh, sometimes our simple minds uh, tend to make it. <coughs> uh, however, keep in mind the leaders of science, they did ask the same question from uh, members of the National Academy of Sciences. S only 7% of them believed in that kind of God, compared to 40% of the scientists in general. National Academy of Sciences is only 2% of the scientists in the United States, less than 2%. Uh, but uh, they are strong in this. The leaders of science are strong in the exclusiveness of science and trying to uh, keep science in a materialistic mode and restricting its outlook. Uh, just to emphasize this point, judge not that ye be not judged. Uh, 19, eight, one of the uh, great events in my life was uh, being at the University of Chicago in 1959 when they were celebrating 100 years of Darwin's origin of species. And uh, strange as it may seem, it, it had the leaders there, you know. You've, you've heard of these guys, you know, Stebbins, uh, Simpson, uh, Leakey was there, uh, Meyer was there, Dobzhansky was there. I mean, this was, these folks are all uh, promoting the, the um, uh, Neo-Darwinism, the modern synthesis, as they call it, that they thought was really great. But they, uh, during this five-day celebration of people all over the world, 1,500 scientists there, uh, celebrating Darwin's intent, they decided to have a convocation in the Rockefeller Chapel, that beautiful Rockefeller Chapel there at the University of Chicago. Carlos, so you go to Rockefeller Chapel. What do you do when you go to chapel? Well, you have an invocation. Oh, very interesting. I have an invocation to Almighty God. So the signs bow their head and invocation to Almighty God. But then Julian Huxley, uh, this is the grandson of the Thomas Huxley we talked about last week. Uh, he gets up in that chapel and he says, he had the, the uh, oration for that, for that uh, uh, event there in the Rockefeller Chapel. He says, the earth was not created, it evolved, so did all the animals and plants that inhabit it, including our human cells, mind and soul, as well as brain and body, so did religion. And he goes on, furthermore, <coughs> says, evolutionary man can no longer take refuge in his loneliness in the arms of a divinized father figure whom he himself has created, nor escape from the responsibility of making decisions by sheltering under the umbrella of divine authority, nor absolve himself from the hard task of meeting his present problems and planning his future by relying on the will of an omniscient but unfortunately inscrutable providence. So you go in this chapel and you have prayer and then say, hey, there's no God. Interesting situation, folks. Do not generalize. Do not overgeneralize. There are a lot of scientists who believe in God. Uh, the leaders of the science community at present, though they're trying to, at least, whether they believe in God or not, they don't say, they say no, uh, science is materialistic. We're going to stay by that definition. And they can define science uh, in any way they want to. If you're looking for truth, you want to go beyond that uh, restricted horizon. Well. Uh, some paradoxes here in this, in this issue here, there's four of them here. Why is God excluded from science when he seems so necessary to explain scientific questions such as the precision of the fine-tuned universe and the origin of life? And there are many more things like that we could mention. <clears throat> Why is it that when four out of ten scientists believe in a God that answers prayer, God is essentially excluded from scientific textbooks and journals? The textbooks and journals do not reflect at least those four out of ten scientists who believe in a God who answers prayer. Why is it acceptable for the scientific community to widely speculate about things for which there is no evidence, while you can't speculate about a God who seems so necessary to explain some of the data of nature? 
You can speculate all kinds of things. No, don't speculate about God. That's not science. Uh, and man, uh, you know, uh, whether it be uh, multiverses or uh, the uh, idea that life arose on Earth because uh, some some space travelers came down and left their garbage here and uh, there were some germs there and that's the way life started and so on. Uh, all kinds of ideas you can speculate about, but not God. Why is the focus of the current debate towards what is science <coughs> and not towards its true reality? Uh, and, you know, this is, this is where they, they often say, oh, it's okay, don't teach creation, but it, this is not science. We're going to exclude God by now. Uh, wh why, why do you do that? Uh, if you're looking for truth or uh, if you uh, don't want to misguide the students, let them see the whole picture. Uh, why? Uh, this is interesting. We've shown this before, but it, it's, it's intuitive and, and uh, significant. It's uh, uh, Richard Lewington's statement, you know. He raises that question here. Uh, he's at Harvard, you know, at, uh, a very famous. Uh, this is a book review of a car, book written by Carl Sagan. <coughs> but he's saying here, our willingness to accept scientific claims are against common <coughs> that are against common sense. Notice his candor here. <coughs> is the key to understanding the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extreme promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories, and you know, we give you some examples of those, <coughs> because we have a prior commitment to materialism. So he's, why? We have a prior commitment to materialism, because we want to go a little further beyond that. Why do we have a prior commitment to materialism? But, Anyway, uh, it is not that the methods and institution of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world. They're not forced into that. <coughs> but on the contrary, we are forced by our a prior adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. No matter how counterintuitive no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, moreover, that material is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Reason, he says, we have this commitment to materialism. Well, it's, it's, I tend to agree very much with this, this particular statement. But uh, <coughs> let me discuss just, just briefly in the last section here in closing. Uh, nature is science's territory. They have a right to, to uh, study nature. That's their home. You should not blame them for studying nature. This is uh, where you get all these data. I, I love this data from nature uh, and so on. Uh, so it's the scientist's roost, uh, per se. However, scientists accept a host of reality, really wild ideas. Uh, and so you, you can say, well, so this is what scientists do. Okay. But they kind of destroy that argument when they get off onto these wild tangents that are way beyond what nature is saying and materialism and so on. Uh, while they really dismiss the, the proposition of God who is active in nature. Hence, the home argument really is not very significant. It is some significance to it, but it's not really strong. But they they uh, discard it all so often. Uh, scientists don't stay at home when they speculate beyond nature's data, of course. Uh, and, you know, we all want to do that. That's, that's, that's a great. Uh, and we should be willing to speculate by God. Another point. Uh, well, here, uh, sometimes scientists, hey, you can't, you can't, 
you can't test something like creation. Then they write books like Scientists Confront Creation. Now, which way do you want it? Can science test creation or can it? If you say you can't do anything about it, why do you write books uh, where they're trying to say, hey, uh, creation is wrong type of thing? Uh, on the other hand, when they say, no, uh, that's not part of the game. So you have uh, the definition of science is nebulous. Uh, overreaction to the constraints of media. Uh, see, when, when uh, we had the restraints of scholasticism and so on, uh, and we had the Enlightenment, you know, and thing, the uh, whole system broke out and we had the, you know, the uh, Renaissance and the French Revolution and so on. Uh, some say this is an overreaction. Michael Pollan, a famous uh, British philosopher of the last century, uh, emphasized this very much. Yeah, the pendulum swung too far from the restrictions of classicism. And so scientists went off uh, totally ignoring uh, religion or anything else as an overreaction. And I think there's something to that point as why, one of the why questions. Then we got this, personal reasons. Pride in science, I, I think this is important, very important. Uh, a scientist is proud to be a scientist. And, and um, incidentally, it is. 11.30, if you're wondering. Uh, scientists uh, <coughs> uh, consider uh, science to be, to be you know, a superior thing, and they, I'm a scientist, and they're not likely to forget this, and I think they have a certain reason to, to be proud of their accomplishments, because science has done a lot of great, good things, uh, and also some that aren't so great, but Anyway, um, then there's a freedom from responsibility in a meaningless world. How much that one is, I don't know. There are scientists who say, hey, uh, no, when you exclude God out of the picture, you've got a meaningless world, uh, you have more freedom. Uh, for instance, take, take uh, uh, this, this letter, Charles Darwin, right after uh, Darwin wrote The Origin of Species. His geology professor at Cambridge, uh, Adam Sedgwick, he wrote this, this to, to Charles Darwin. He's telling him here, there is a moral metaphysical part of nature as well as a physical. He's telling him, hey, get, get beyond that materialistic trap you're in. A man who denies this is deep in the mire of folly. This is what he's telling to Charles Darwin. Tis the crown and glory of organic science that it does through final cause, it <coughs> causes link material to moral. In other words, he's saying in the biological world, you know, you've got uh, material and moral together. You have done your best in one or two pregnant cases to break it. Were it possible, which thank God it is not, to break it, humanity, in my mind, would suffer a damage that might brutalize it and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since its written records tell us of its history. Now, he's concerned about the loss of morality. This, this is a, an important issue. And are you free from the restraints of morality uh, when you adopt a materialist philosophy? That, that was Sedgwick's uh, <coughs> uh, view on this. Um, here's another, Aldous Huxley. <coughs> he was a chemist for a while and so on, but became a writer. Brave New World, where he pointed out how uh, science tends to destroy meaningless. That's just a novel he wrote. A very good writer. This is a grandson of Thomas Huxley, incidentally the brother of Julian Huxley uh, that we quoted earlier. Uh, he makes this, he says, for myself, no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness, this is where you get rid of God, and the moral responsibility and so on, was essentially an instrument of liberation. <coughs> liberation we desire with simultaneous 
uh, liberation from a certain political and economic system and liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom and we objected to the political and economic system because it was unjust. The supporters of these systems claim that in some way they embodied the meaning, parentheses, a Christian meaning, they insisted, you can see a little bit where he's going with this, <coughs> of the world. There was one admirably simple method of confuting these people and at the same time justifying ourselves in our political neurotic revolt. We could deny that the world had any meaning whatsoever. As in the days of La Maitre, remember La Maitre from last week, uh, was, his books were burned, he had to move from France and then he burned in Holland, he had to move from there and so on. Anyway, uh, in the uh, <coughs> days of La Maitre, and his successors, the desire to justify a certain sexual looseness played a part in the popularization of meaninglessness. So you, you say, hey, they, you get a certain freedom here. Uh, Gould, uh, Stephen Gould, uh, uh, kind of alludes to this uh, a little bit. When, and this is the last sentence in uh, this book he wrote about the Burgess Shield uh, called A Wonderful Life. He says, we are the offspring of history and must establish our own paths in this most diverse and interesting of conceivable universes. Uh, he's, of course, he denies us any God. And, uh, he says, One indifference to our suffering and therefore offering us maximum freedom. Uh, there's a certain freedom you get uh, when you uh, are not responsible uh, to some superior uh, force or God or so on, to thrive or fail in our own chosen way. So it's uh, rather, rather interesting. Well, uh, lastly, I'll just mention the last uh, reason for uh, a secular agenda. Uh, social approval and survival. Right at present, if you want to keep your job as a scientist, uh, you, you can't invoke God in the classroom, at least in public institutions and so on. You, you get fired. Uh, it's a sociological requirement, more or less, that you have to fit with it. And then the, there's the question of approval, because the creation is ridiculed, and you don't like to be part of the ridicule. Uh, so, you know, it tends to uh, influence uh, th th that strong, if you're a scientist, you don't deal with religion. Be a scientist, uh, type of thing. So uh, that's, I think, a fairly strong factor. I suspect this, and the uh, the personal factor of the, the pride and and uh, freedom uh, that you get from are part of the reasons why uh, materialism seems appealing, uh, at least to to uh, a significant number of. Uh, scientists in this. In, in the conclusions, I just want to mention, uh, we've talked about this, I, I, it's, it's so striking I want to mention it again. Uh, the Bible predicted that in the last days here in Peter, people would be willingly ignorant of creation and the flood. That's right there. You've seen this, creation went out the window with evolution, the flood went out the window, when the Long Ages came in, 19th century happened, and so on. Uh, Peter could have predicted so many different things that would happen in the last. He picked these very two issues, the basic issues here in this major battle here between creation and evolution. Then we have uh, Second Timothy who, uh, I don't know if Paul is talking about this per se, but it's, it's an interesting suggestion here that for the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned onto fables. Uh, it may be that Paul was referring to this time, I'm not sure, but it certainly seems to fit uh, in this case, at least, uh, what is going on? Finally, 
in the last century and a half, the study of nature has been restricted to materialistic explanation, explain, to a materialistic explanatory menu. As many seems too simplistic for the reality that we experience. In searching for ultimate truth, we should expand the horizon of our outlook and not restrict it. The present limiting secularistic ethos of science is counterproductive if you're looking for truth. Science should return to the more open perspective of the founders of modern science, a perspective that included God in the explanatory menu. God had created the laws of nature that made science possible. So that is the, uh, the conclusion of this. It's, uh, and to, to me, the uh, bottom line to certain it is, sure, materialism is good. And a lot of it points, a lot of it points to a creator, necessity for a creator in this. Uh, that package makes more sense to me uh, than the restricted, pas restricted passage of, uh, of um, the closed materialistic box that science has put itself in lately. Yeah. I certainly appreciated the way you put it. it. The question is not, is science correct, but what is truth? Right. However, we should realize that that's answered too. We're now facing something called postmodernism, which gleefully insists there is no such thing as truth. So that isn't the question. And unfortunately, there's a strong affinity for that notion in our church. Isn't there an institute to study postmodernism which comes out sounding more in defense than against it? And uh, postmodernism thought seems to pervade a, a very great array of our academic thinking. I. Uh when I bang my wall, my head against the wall, I, I believe there is such a thing as truth. I, it, uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I realize that, you know, postmodernism is, is making, uh, it's mudding the, the water, so to speak, and so on. But uh, you stand by the materialistic uh, material. Uh, which I think is solider. It does point to necessity for, for God and so on. That package makes more sense. You say, well, we don't know. No, no there's reality. I face it, there's reality. Yeah. Also, oh, it's a <clears throat> fascinating discussion, but um, I, it, it seems a bit one-sided. Um, I, you know, uh, when we talk, it seems like the, the, the issue is not some conspiracy against God that, that we have to address. It's one of recognizing that there's an uncertainty in the definition of the categories of metaphysics. I, mean, I, I saw no, dis, no comments in your discussion at all from, uh, from Popper, Hume, Kant, in there, those that define who science, what science is, the philosophy of science. Mm -hmm. you, you're using I see you using scientists as the authority for that definition, but they're, they're lousy at defining what science is. Uh, it, it's those in the realm of the philosophy of science that we should really be looking at to, to as, as ones who have a better objective uh, uh, and, uh, analysis of what science is. And, you know, for example, I, I, don't, uh, I don't see a, a definition of what science should be using for, for mm -hmm. God. You say there's, you know, there's many definitions, mm -hmm. but, but uh, which, one, is, which, which mm -hmm. one should science adopt? I, I, I see no effort to, to, to uh, say what that is. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, or, yeah. or when God acts in nature, mm -hmm. how do we investigate that? Uh, we, you know, it's it's yeah. defining. Mm -hmm. You know, what is wrong with with uh, looking at God's mm -hmm. actions in in uh, in the world and say when when we want to stop bring God into it, <laughs> we're now talking mm -hmm. about metaphysics, not mm -hmm. science. But science is a, is is a 
is a, a subset of metaphysics, so it's a part of the discussion, but so is the philosophy and the theology. They're all involved in mm -hmm. the discussion that should be made towards yeah. metaphysics. And, and uh, you know, and, and, and we're, we're seeing a lot of energy being here, being mm -hmm. spent here on uh, trying to fix mm -hmm. where God is when he's a part of the discussion anyway when we talk about reality as a whole. And, uh, and and so um, you know it's it's, it's that that component mm -hmm. that that we need to be uh, addressing, not just this uh, one-sided uh, uh, emphasis by many in the scientific community that want to leave God out, because that's not the whole picture. And it would be good to include a much broader mm -hmm. uh, a, a view so that we can have a real a rational more rational, less emotional discussion of, of, uh, 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 you know, of these issues. I, I hope you understand that I, I very much want to include God in the discussion. Oh yeah, well, and it should be, but it's, uh, but it's one of recognizing that when we do, we really are moving into metaphysics, we're moving out of science into metaphysics. I don't see any problem with that. There the, shouldn't uh, be any problem with that. I, I would also add, you know, that uh, uh, so popular to find science, you know, it's testability and so on. Uh, a lot of philosophers disagree with that. There's so many differences in science out there. I'm not so interested in one particular definition of science. I'm interested in finding reality. Well, that's right, and that's why we're it's, talking it's, about a metaphysical discussion, and we need to define mm -hmm. in that discussion but, clearly where the boundaries are mm -hmm. and the categories of, uh, of uh, and the subsets of metaphysics. I would further suggest that uh, you know, when the probability that uh, the fine-tuned universe, uh, oh, uh, I'm trying to think of that, a guy at Oxford, uh, he put all these, you know, these uh, fine-tuned things together and said, you know, well, it's the probability that uh, the universe could be fine-tuned is one chance out of the, 10 of 10 to the raised to the 125th or probably the figure was up there. You know. when, when you have that, you know, I think uh, this forces you into metaphysics. Uh, very good case. The origin of life. How, how you can get all these atoms, molecules together, all at the same time, same place on the earth for life to reason by itself. No, you, you got to, you got to, you got to uh, broaden out your, your, your scope. Uh, so I think there is, uh, you talk about the, you raised the question about the miraculous. I think there is that data out there that pretty much forces you and say, hey. Yeah, but but, uh, you, but you need to have, the you not only need to point, poke holes in it, you can't just poke holes in it, you need to come up with suggestions as to right. how to address miracles as an investigative process then. If you're going to bring God in, because, you know, if we, we look at science as one of looking at a sequence of causal processes. Okay, if God is a part of that causal <laughs> process, he, then we have to look at metaphysical time rather than just physical time as part of the discussion. Fine, We're saying, fine. Yeah, and that's... And, just and, don't and that's restrict, mind. just don't restrict your circle. Okay, to, but then let's to not naturalism. just say that, that science has to be something different than what it is. Well, well Metaphysics is different from science. Uh, and we have to be willing to allow the investigation I, uh, to... I don't to think there's a good line between metaphysics and science. I don't think there's a good well, line. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Are we defining metaphysics or are we defining science? I'd like uh, to I, take... I don't, I don't uh, see it clearly. I'm looking... I'm looking for reality. I would yeah. like to take a slightly different tack, but in agreement somewhat with what you're saying. Uh, I want to con congratulate you on the well-organized and very interesting presentation that covers a lot of the most important ideas in the history of science during the 20th century. But I think we also have to recognize that the characterization that your sampling gives there that suggests there's a strong warfare and that scientists are on one side and theologians on the other uh, has changed during the 20th century, which was in transition. And the things that changed it, essentially, mm -hmm. were first uh, relativity theory, which came right at the beginning, then quantum theory, and then uh, logical positivism, which you mentioned. 
and uh, it largely refuted the kind of materialistic naturalism that you're talking about in the physical sciences. Uh, we uh, have people, for instance, like James Jeans, the British astronomer, mm -hmm. who said the more we know about the universe, it look, looks like a great thought rather than a great machine. And he clearly had because of the tendency to behave in the way that we think of as mathematical. Mm -hmm. And uh, he clearly believed in design. Einstein was never convinced of the ultimate soundness of quantum theory. And he said, God does not play the dice with the universe. And he said, mystery is one of the most important aspects of science. And now it's true that in the biological sciences, and even more in the social sciences, materialism, mechanistic materialism, still hangs on. B.F. Skinner with his view of man as a stimulus response machine, mm -hmm. harking clear back to Locke, the mind is a tabula rasa, an environment writes everything on it that it has. It has no free will or anything of its sort. I might add as a personal note that when I was working on my doctorate at UCLA, I studied it under both Carnap and Reichenbach, who were both members of the Vienna Circle along with Schlick, and probably just as influential and important on the movement. And I rejected their point of view completely. I think their view of their theory of knowledge is or as nothing but experimental method. Their mm -hmm. epistemology was totally wrong, and that view has largely been eclipsed. There are very few real positivists around anymore. They had an impact, and they helped to sharpen up logic and so on, but uh, they didn't do much. Their rejection of ontology or metaphysics completely, their rejection of value theory and insistence that values were nothing but just impulse, uh, has been totally rejected. And it's true in the biological sciences. You have people like Dawkins and... Uh, uh, who still hang on to that view, but you also have people, as I mentioned last week, like Francis Collins, one of the co-discoverers, or deciphers, decoders of the human genome, who's a conservative evangelical Christian. You have paleontologists like uh, Tillard de Chardin that uh, actually said evolution is heading toward a Christ logos, which he interpreted as being of the kingdom of God as it's described in the Bible. And your own statistics suggest that four out of ten scientists regard themselves as theists of some right. sort. So I don't think there's nearly the warfare between science and religion any longer. You, you were describing there with your selection mm -hmm. a real warfare that has existed and still exists. But I think there's also another uh, rapprochement and a uh, detente that's going on, and science and religion uh, mm -hmm. have moved toward one another to the extent that science today represent a spectrum. So they represent a spectrum mm -hmm. of all these views. Uh, it's no longer a science against religion, quite in the way that would suggest. I very much hope that this will happen pretty soon, and that uh, they will be allowing to teachers to mention creation in the public schools. When they start doing that, then I know, hey, we're, we're, uh, we're moving in, in the right direction. Right at present, the student gets a very biased view of reality in, in science class. Um, I really appreciate the brother who brought up these questions uh, of metaphysical and science and all this. It reminded me of an event that happened uh, at my alma mater at Queen's University. And there was a conference, well, a, a seminar announced. There was going to be, I, did I ever tell you about this? There was going to be a discussion on the subject and the topic is is Jesus divine? And the, the dis discussants are going to be a professor of religion, a professor of philosophy, and a professor of uh, women's studies. Okay, so.
First of all, this topic was of great interest. Now, Queen's mm -hmm. University was started as a Presbyterian institution many years before, more than 100 years prior. It has since drifted into secular long ago. However, at this point, there was such an overwhelming response of people who wanted to be present for this presentation that they had to move to a larger venue. And the larger venue was all packed. And they finally got there, and they finally started a discussion. And it went like this. The professor of religious studies went on like this. Is Jesus divine? Well, of course, there are all these concerns about the provenance of the biblical texts, and we don't really have very good data, uh, very authentic <clears throat> manuscripts. Uh, we don't really know uh, who <clears throat> said what, where, and whether it was actually them speaking or somebody else in their name. Uh, or somebody else by the same name, or, or some such thing. In the end, the question was left mm, somehow in midair. And then came the philosopher's turn to discuss this, and he went on like this. Is Jesus divine? This question consists of three words is a state of being. Jesus, a designation of a person, and divine, an adjective. Let us consider each one of these in turn. Is, state, what do we mean by is? Something that is, maybe in my mind, something that is, may or may not be so. Ultimately, after about uh, 10 minutes of discussion on is, we concluded that we didn't know what is meant. And then we come with Jesus. What do we mean by this? Well, people use this in all kinds of settings, with all kinds of meanings. What on earth are we referring to? And does it actually even have to refer to a person? Does it even have to refer to a historical person? There are lots of people these days with that name, Jesus, you know, is a popular name in some <laughs> circles. Okay. Then comes to the question of divine. Now, I had an ice cream that was absolutely positively divine. What on earth do I mean by divine? Since I therefore do not understand what I mean by any of these three words, I do not know what the answer to the question ought to be. Therefore, I rest my case. Then came the feminist. And you know what she had to say. She had to say this way. The whole patriarchal system was designed and propagated for the simple purpose of misogynist suppression of women through history. And the sooner it is overturned, the better. End of story. <laughs> now, now came the time for question and answer period. And my mentor, God rest his soul, <sighs> raised his hand and said, um, I wonder if perhaps we could find some help in what Jesus actually said himself. And everybody in the audience and the people on the panel said, oh, okay, okay, fine. And then he says, because in the Gospel of John, he said that he was. And the School of Religion professor at that point retorted, he did? Yeah. <laughs> 
So why did I go <coughs> through all this anecdote? <laughs> definitions, definitions do not help us. We, wait, 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 wait. The first requirement in us knowing anything has to be a willingness to know. If I do not want to know something, you can pile evidence from here mm -hmm. to the moon, and I can argue, well, yes, but that doesn't really touch my line of thinking. Mm -hmm from this point of view, or from that point of view, or some other world setting. You see, I have to be will There is no way we can communicate unless we're willing to communicate. Language itself, <coughs> like that philosopher, we can degrade it to the point where it loses all meaning. As Bill Clinton managed to demonstrate, when he argued on the subject of what is the meaning of is, and he being a lawyer knows how to argue such things. You know, we have to be willing to communicate in order to be able to communicate. There is no foolproof method to ensure that communication will occur. It has to be willingness both on the part of the person uh, how should I say, sending and on the part of the person receiving said communication. If there is no such, uh, how should I say, connection, there is not going to be communication. That's a very simple, obvious fact. It doesn't matter what the subject. The subject comes later. First has to be a willingness. So then, if we do have the willingness, the first thing that I have discovered in my life is that I have to be willing to try to see something through the eyes of the person who is speaking. Not to see what he's saying strictly through my own eyes and say, ah, this is all. <coughs> hogwash because it's not in my terms it's not using my terminology it's not using my language it's not using my diction perhaps it's not using uh, my standards of eloquence or whatever that kind of you know when i see my beagle zippy i see intelligence and I do not ask whether my beagle is thinking in metaphysical or scientific or any other terms. He is trying to relate to me like a real person. And I try to relate to him like a real dog. I don't try to say, oh, this is a figment in my imagination that's barking right now. That, that is silliness. <laughs> and I don't think that the dog is less of a creature simply because he cannot do calculus. Uh, I think I've, okay. I've launched into a bit of a sermon here, okay. but I think I've addressed some of these issues which bother me tremendously, mm -hmm. that when we bring one issue of confrontation with reality, people complain that something else has not been addressed. There is always we cannot, in limited lifespan, cover everything. That's an impossibility. We have to be willing to cover something. Thank you for that uh, sermon, uh, Professor. I'm impressed. It was worth the time you took to say what you said. And thank you, Dr. Roth, because you are a reservoir, an impressive reservoir of knowledge. Thank you for the time you have taken to prepare the lesson for today. And you You're took welcome. your entire life to prepare this. <laughs> Thank you. Said, yeah.
Now, you, in your presentation, you make reference to a meeting that was uh, started with a prayer mm -hmm. and then ended <laughs> denying the meaning of prayer. Well, that brought to my mind something that happened about three weeks ago. I've been absent from this classroom, but I have not been wasting my time. I'm doing my work, sharing what I learn here with others. I think that that is my duty. I was in another classroom, Sabbath school classroom, that started with a prayer. And then, all the participants, I would say, with the exception of one, were in agreement that there's no evidence of intelligent design. I mean, that really bothered me. And I did what my friend did. I stood up. I was incensed. And I said, I have a proposal. We started with a prayer and then negated everything that prayer means. So my suggestion is, from now on, let's forget about praying to somebody who may not exist. I was really serious. So I appreciate the fact that there is a classroom here on this campus where God is honored. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm going to make uh, one comment, I think, and that is that one of the things that we can do is uh, recognize that there are different definitions of science. And one of them is what scientists do or it could be termed the current, kinds, uh, current scientific consensus, which is different from previous ones and which in all probability will be different from future ones. Um, that's kind of the democratic view of scientists. What do most scientists vote for? Uh, one of them is that it is a methodology and the results uh, that have been garnered from that methodology. And those are two, uh, methodology being specifically the study of the reproducible uh, in an organized fashion that tests the reproducibility under various circumstances. Experiments, in other words. And those two definitions are not necessarily the same. And if you read that every time you read science and you ask which definition is being used, I think it will make things much more clear. Now, Ariel Roth took a um, little over an hour here and uh, still didn't touch the, uh, uh, the issue of the philosophy of science and uh, what is science and where do we go from there. Um, that's not because it couldn't be addressed, it's because it couldn't be addressed in the, in the time frame uh, that he had. Uh, I have a book called Scientific Theology that reviews various definitions of science that have been uh, used, including the positivistic one and its flaws and the reason why it's not uh, well known now. The Popperian one which changed with Popper and which uh, uh, has its own flaws. And uh, it comes up with, uh, I think, the best definition that we have right now is one that uh, uh, belongs to, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce his name, Lakaitish or something like that. It's a uh, Hungarian name, and unfortunately my son knows more Hungarian than I do. Legatos. Um, but um, so it can be addressed, and I think that if you address in the in that way, you'll find that in fact that method can be used not only for science but for religion. And so the kind of hard and fast 
line that you try to put using methodology falls apart and you basically have the study of the reproducible. And in some cases, it is reproducible that if you see two layers that fit together that are supposed to be six or 10 or 20 million years apart, that if you go someplace else, you'll find the same thing. That's reproducible. And that's evidence for maybe not quite so much time. And so I think that science does start to impinge on the miraculous. Or at least on the, uh, on things that don't have a current mechanistic explanation and may never. In fact, uh, the same thing could be said for carbon-14 dating. The same thing could even be said for quantum mechanics itself, which is mathematically understandable, but for which there is no known or reasonably anticipated at this point mechanism. That, the, that to, if push came to shove, the universe appears to be more mathematical than it is mechanistic. So I think that <laughs> it's a fruitful discussion, but I think also that eventually we're going to find that the attempt to make hard and fast lines between science and religion uh, fails. And that's one of the reasons why um, I am deeply skeptical of uh, Stephen Jay Gould's idea that you have two separate magisteria because I think they overlap and I think that uh, if you establish some magisterium that you give to one side it will gradually creep in until it takes over the whole thing. Well that's basically the consequence of his, of his yeah. approach. Yeah, that's right. We say there's no non-overlapping magisteria just that ours is taking over everything. You know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, it, it's a tough issue. I mean, they've been struggling with, uh, on this, uh, you know, science of philo uh, philosophy of science for 300 years. It's a tough issue, but if we're going if we're going to demand that we include God, and and as part of the explan ex explanationary menu, uh, then we need to propose a definition of God so that we don't, you know. Violate uh, some logical fallacies about misdefinitions. They <laughs> are important. You cannot have a, a rational conversation without, you know, without the presence of definitions of you know what science is, what God is, what His actions are. Those <laughs> have to be defined in a way so that they can be investigated. <laughs> we're, if we're going to, we need to do, uh, make that a part of the discussion. Or we're just going to be talking to ourselves and ta talking over everybody because everybody's not going to, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's just not going to be a clear discussion between anybody. I mean, this is a good start. I, I, I appreciate, you know, all the information that's been presented. But we have to recognize that if we are going to have inroads into the mm -hmm. scientific community, we, not, we have to do it with clarity and, uh, and persuasiveness. You know, if we're, if we're stuck at the bottom uh, of wondering whether a person's going to listen to us, it means that we're not being persuasive. And, and so there's, there's uh, uh, you know, we have to look at ourselves and why are we talking over other people? Because we're not looking at not comparing definitions. We're not comparing, uh, uh, you know, uh, perspectives. And so, uh, as clearly as we should, so that we can have a persuasive conversation, and that's what I hope we can get to. I, th I, could I, just I think definitions are helpful. Uh, I would point out in the history you were here last week, uh, the god that was rejected by science in the 19th century, uh, Dampier, Sir William Dampier, the uh, famous historian in England points out that very clearly at the end of the 18th century, the science believed in the God of the Bible and the flood. It was that, that, it was that kind of God that got rejected in the 19th century. Now, 
Uh, I think we can redefine God any way we want to, but uh, historically you can at least start from that point uh, as, as to what has happened here. Uh, science, uh, to a certain extent, and this is uh, almost pejorative, uh, but I think to a certain extent has redefined science from what it used to be. Earlier when Kepler, Galileo, uh, Lene, uh, Pascal, Boyle, uh, these folks all included God in their science as the one who had originated these laws of science. They had no trouble producing good science in that, in that milieu. You can do it. You don't have to exclude God to do good science. Uh, they did it, and you know, Kepler, Kepler, some of his laws are still valid now, and so on. Uh, it was uh, a great thing uh, at that time. But now to say, uh, no, we can't, we can't look at creation because it's not science. Uh, you've redefined science from what it was in the uh, 18th century. You redefined it and so on. It's okay to redefine. We redefine terms all the time. Uh, but you wonder if uh, it is warranted and uh, if the success of science hasn't, uh, and it's been very successful for us. Uh, when we put people on the uh, moon and talk about sending people to Mars, and so on, we get very impressed. I, I do anyway, uh, with the success of science. Uh, if that hasn't produced a, an isolationist mentality that has restricted its, its uh, horizon of investigation, I think this has been bad for science. Could I add just a brief, very brief uh, note to that dialogue, postscript? I think a lot of people who call themselves atheists are really uh, rejecting just a particular definition of God, to get to your point. And it can be easily pinpointed by saying it's too anthropomorphic. The way uh, J.B. Phillips put it in his little book, Your God is Too Small, is that so often uh, God is defined in terms that strip him of mm -hmm. infinitude or omniscience or omnipotence or all the things that traditionally have been assigned. But that's not peculiar to scientists like Gould and uh, uh, Dawkins. It's also found very much among theologians. Theologians yes. reject a very anthropomorphic yeah, concept so. of science just as much as scientists do. No, that was, uh, you say the problem mm -hmm. is if you're going to define God, uh, and there's a question of whether a being that's infinite, and omniscient, and omnipotent, all that can even be defined. People who said no, they couldn't even name God. And uh, whether you can know ultimate reality, either scientifically or uh, Stephen Hawking just wrote an interesting article in the last, I think it was a special issue of Scientific American, in which he said, I'm sorry, in which he said that he doubted that we'd ever find a final theory in science, that whatever reality is, it's yeah. probably beyond anything we can define. Yeah, right. And you remember Haldane's interesting remark, which quantum theory seems to confirm, mm -hmm. reality is not only stranger than we think, it's stranger than we can think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm than we can imagine. Um, no, it's, right now, it, it is, there are atheistic theologians, which is, you know, uh, shocking. Uh, we, uh, definitions are useful, we, we have to have them and so on, uh, and we change them and so on. So, so uh, to have dialogue, to a certain extent, you have to have definition of terms, uh, but uh, it's very hard to define some of these terms, extremely hard to define, uh, and so keep that in, we need to keep that in mind. It's a, yeah, it's, it's extremely hard, but let's make some progress there and, and offer mm -hmm. suggestions on how to investigate things like miracles. 
and uh, God's I'll action. make, excuse me, I'll make my remarks, because we have to make my remarks, and I definitely will next week. It's getting late. And uh, I have taught religions of the world and women's studies. And um, I would like to have something to say next week about this. And I, I really would. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've got a, a wonderful, uh, and, and about God and Jesus and Tot and all of this. Uh, I'll have my, my I'll, I'll share it with you next week. Hopefully. Let, let, okay. let me, let me uh, just make one. It is not completely irrational to believe the Bible. There is geographical authentication. There's historical authentication. There is pro prophetic authentication uh, and so on. Uh, put that in the box. Uh, and uh, find out which box seems most reasonable. To, to me, the, uh, the biblical model seems the most reasonable to me. Um, if, I, if I may just reply to brother who, who would like to get us to a firmer ground. It reminds me of what Moses asked. Well, what shall I say? <clears throat> who has sent me? And God himself came up with a description of himself. And what was that description? All right. If God himself could not come up with something more profound than that, or perhaps we haven't yet realized how profound that is. Isn't that saying, though, that he's suggesting that we learn of him i am what i am come and learn true true and but you can't do that by knowing him all at once well that that's one thing but i i'm saying is we can argue about the definition of being and i think in the end we will not have an awful lot of satisfaction because we have such a weak concept of what it means to be. God, however, has a much better concept of what that means. And in spite of that, he still felt that was the best way he could describe himself. I have not seen nor ear heard. Absolutely. What has been so Amen. And, uh, <laughs> this guy over here. Say yeah, I, I just wanted to insert a comment about definitions. In the end, definitions is, especially for many controversial terms, are what you feel it is. In other words, a lot of people come and they think about certain subjects and they argue about them, and if they want something, they might change the definition uh, uh, to, in, to something that they feel that, that goes in line with their line of reasoning. Um, I could put an example, for instance, that the, uh, something that's going on in society right now is the definition of marriage. It's, uh, people will define it in, if, according to their line of reasoning. If you have a... Uh, uh, if you're arguing with your spouse about something, sometimes it's only the definition of certain words that are being uh, confronted with, with each other. So there is, a, there is a connection between definitions and feelings, opinions, and I think that uh, definitions go within a certain context. Uh, it could be an individual context, it could be a context in time, but when you come to, to definitions that should be used, it, that should be used within the context of, of what's reasonable, what makes common sense, what's the intention, what's the meaning. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I, um, well, I'm just gonna say, I, I appreciate uh, this problem of, of postmodernism, so on, it's the way I feel, but if you, if you go into, it, it's just the way I feel, as a definition, how are you going to communicate with other people it's when somebody feels differently? You're you, you going lose, to lose language when you do that too much. You, you've got to have some, something to fall back on. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big concern because uh, a lot of what happens and what we're dealing with is, is dealing with the logical fallacy of equivocation. And uh, uh, we, we want to try to avoid that. Um, but anyway, I'm just glad that there's a lot of people here that are uh, committed to hard thinking. And that's, that's the important thing. Very recently, um, Harvard graduate in his valedictorian speech says, um, in this world, everything goes. You can say or do whatever you want to as long as long as there is nothing called absolute. You see, uh, <laughs> and isn't that what we are today? Uh, even mm -hmm. among us Seventh-day Adventists, uh, the Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and life. Uh, do we need any definition for that anymore? I am. I am that great I am. I am the way, the truth, and life. Mm -hmm. No one comes to the Father except for me. There's a medication called Zygres. Very, very expensive medicine made by uh, Eli Lilly. Thousands of dollars. You can give that to a very sick, mm -hmm. septic patient and kill him in no time. They're the ones who want to push it, push it, and push it. The infectious society of the states mm -hmm. will not accept it. Many, mm -hmm. And then they, the makers of the Zygres says, what heartless people you are. You see, you see them polarized. These are all scientists, one going against the other one. What is the absolute truth? Is it the yet or the jaguar that one can buy, or is it standing for what they know is right? Uh, what is truth? What is truth? And I think mm -hmm. we all need to struggle with we, we Just because something came up in New England Journal of Medicine does not mean that it is the absolute truth. There, there is a um, uh, aphorism that talks about the convenience of agnosticism, what? the convenience of agnosticism to avoid a painful decision. Uh, uh, you need to avoid that. You can go too far in that area. But we need to be humble also. I think uh, you folks have a good Sabbath. <laughs>